This week's podcast is brought to you in part by SuplexApparel.com, a clothing brand team of pro wrestlers consisting of Zack Sabre Jr., Mako Satomura, Matt Riddle, Jeff Cobb, Angelico, and now Tony Storm. Suplex JPN3 is out now. T-shirts, hoodies, headwear, and more ships worldwide. SuplexApparel.com, pro wrestling-focused clothing for both wrestlers and fans alike. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. All right, how you doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to the Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a life podcast. It's a personal journal. It's an entryway into the minds, the souls, the hearts, and the lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host. My name is Colt Cabana. I am back to podcasting. I am a podcaster. I'm also a member of SAG. You didn't know that since we've last talked to each other, I am a SAG member. I am in the Screen Actors Guild. That means I am also a DVD watcher, but I I used to be a person who didn't have a DVD player because I just had computers and I got rid of the DVD players a long time ago. Pretty shitty for a guy who's selling DVDs, but that's the facts. But I went out and I bought myself a DVD USB uh, attachment that goes to my computer, so now I can watch all the free DVDs that are supposed to be in movie theaters now, but I get to watch them at home because I am a member of SAG. Most importantly, though, I am a professional wrestler, and yes, I am sitting here live in my studio apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Before I go any further, this is a fan support and listen supported podcast supported by people just like you. I give it to you some Thursdays, coltcabana.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways that you could support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend. Let them know. I used to say Facebook, maybe Twitter, maybe Instagram, but you better believe now I'm saying make a TikTok about it. I am on TikTok at Colcabetta. It's not that good yet. I don't have many followers, but I watch a lot of TikToks and it has taken over my life. I am one of you, basically. I want you to know I'm part of the youth. I'm still in my 30s, not for much longer, but I am basically a 30s guy trying to be a 20s guy trying to understand what the teenagers want. I don't know but I do like TikTok. Other ways to support, Patreon. The Patreon is where you can listen to these shows ad-free. It's also where you see I have the video talk with Will Ospreay, and you can listen to the next five talks. They're already posted on Patreon. It's only five bucks a month. The archives are four bucks a month. Or if you're generous, you can give me more. Or if you're not generous, you can give me less. And the main way, ColtMerch.com, DigitalCult.com, T-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, digital downloads, premium podcasts, much, much more. Too much talking in the beginning, but I'm giddy. Can you tell? I'm giddy. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to bring back the podcast. Blue Chew has sponsored this run of podcasts. We won't get to their ad yet, but I got to give them a little love. And you should give them some love, too. They're giving you love in your pants. All right, the guest this week, Will Ospreay. I forgot what I usually do. Do I talk about life before first, or do I talk about the guest first? We'll talk about Will. Will's on the show. This was right before Wrestle Kingdom. Oh, I do stuff for New Japan now. I don't know if you know that. There's so much to talk about. Last time I was podcasting consistently, having these guests on, I was part of DDT. Before that, Noah. Before that, Zero One. Now, New Japan. This week specifically, I will be wrestling with my new tag team partner, Yano, in the New Japan USA shows. But it all leads to Will and I being in Japan together. Will lives in Japan now which is a crazy thing, also something a lot of these guys are starting to do. I never had the balls to do it. I went to England a little bit, but I'm not going to buy a residence in Japan. These wrestlers, they love New Japan so much. They're living in Japan full-time. I was going to say they're living in New Japan full-time, not to be confused with old Japan. They are living there full-time, and they are what a wrestler is. I've always loved the idea of Japan. I've always said Japan is where you go when America won't show you any love, and you know you're good. But for some reason, America just won't give you the love. I've had it before. Many others have had it before. I guess I won't say that America's not giving Will Ospreay the love. But I bet if WWE was like, here's $8 million, he'd be like, well, Japan, 
I got to go. But I'm just speaking for him. I don't know. Maybe that's not the case. Eight million is a lot. I mean, I understand if they're like one million. He's like, no, I love New Japan. But eight million dollars, I feel you got to do it, right? So proving my point, uh, no love in America, but so much love in Japan. Uh, It's where the wrestlers, wrestlers head over to. And that is what's happening right now. Will is in a complete up climb of his career. He's always been in an up climb of his career, which is the the idea. It's what you do. You climb up. You consistently get better. You learn. You grow. And we'll talk all about that as we sit in the Tokyo Dome Hotel and chat at it. That chat will come up in a little bit. For me personally, what am I doing? I'm wrestling. I kissed a man's penis. That seemed to be frowned upon by many in the wrestling community. I'm going to say zero when it comes to my fans. Here's what I'll say about this. Also, I don't have a script. I wasn't going off it. I was just thinking of stuff that I've done. Because I did wrestle at Wrestlepalooza for first wrestling. I am the Jewish champion. First wrestling has been doing shows at a synagogue, thanks to Rabbi Fine. I did wrestle for Lucha Libre and laughs, and on and on. I'm keeping a consistent schedule like I always have. But at bar wrestling, it was midnight, and I wanted to kiss somebody, and my tag team partner that night was Joey Ryan. But let's be honest, the star of that show is his wiener, and I thought it would be cute to kiss the star of the show at midnight. A lot of people straight up homophobic and they're trying to hide around it that they're not, but just straight up homophobic because if that's something that weirds you out or gets you mad, I'm going to say, why is it? And and you're going to defend yourself. Here's what people are defending themselves against besides saying I have homophobia is I don't want that in my wrestling. And yes, I'm using that voice. I'll do it again. I don't want that in my wrestling. I just like kicking and punching and that's the wrestling that I like. I don't want that. Now he's turned weird Australian. I don't know. I'm assuming it's a guy also. I didn't get a lot of flack from the ladies or other genders. But fine. You don't want that in your wrestling. I have always said that I'm a very versatile wrestler. I'll wrestle a children's style in front of children. I'll wrestle a Japanese strong style, especially, let's say, in Noah. I'll wrestle lucha style when I do lucha vavoom. And bar wrestling is made for that crowd, an adult crowd. It's bar wrestling, 18 and up. You might not want that at your wrestling, but I know my audience, and that night in that VFW hall on New Year's Eve, that is exactly the wrestling that that crowd wants. I'm sorry somebody filmed it and put it on the internet, but I'm wrestling for my audience on that night, and that's what they want, and that's what they got. Great way to ring in 2020, and you can't. Get me upset. All right, we got a new batch of podcasts coming up. This is the very first one. Back to the old formula. I'm not, for legal purposes, I'm not doing Song of the Week anymore. I don't even know if that is. Listen, you know what I've been through. I'm just not chancing anything, which is weird when I'm going to put up what Blue Chew will be sponsoring. But Blue Chew will be sponsoring a a mini talk before the actual talk, and we'll get into it. In a second, this week's episode is sponsored by BlueChew.com. Fellas, and I don't mean it in the shameless way, I just mean it, well, maybe I do mean it in the shameless way. Fellas, do you remember the days when you were always ready to go? Those days are still there and can be brought out of you by BlueChew.com. BlueChew brings the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach and Since they're chewable, they work up to twice as fast as a pill, so you can be ready whenever the opportunity arises. I assume that pun is intended. If you're looking to benefit from more confidence where it counts, Blue Chew is the fast and easy way to enhance your performance. Blue Chew is prescribed online by licensed physicians, so you don't have to go to the doctor's office or wait in a line at the pharmacy. It ships right to your door in a discreet package. It's made in the U.S., and since Blue Chew prepares and ships direct... They're cheaper than a pharmacy, so that means no more awkwardness. If you're interested, myself and Blue Chew, we got a great deal for you. Free. That's a pretty good deal. Just go to BlueChew.com and get your first shipment for free when you use the promo code COLT. Just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com. Try for free with the promo code COLT. Just pay that shipping. Blue Chew, the better, cheaper, faster choice. And we thank you for sponsoring today's podcast. All right, the mini talk this week is from a very famous YouTube personality who loves doing shoot interviews on YouTube. 
He's Canadian, he's a wrestler, and he's talked to all of the greats. And now, on The Art of Wrestling, before Will Ospreay, he's going to talk to me. Normally, I am the interviewer. Now, Hannibal, you talked to some crap about me because you don't like the way that I, I uh, interacted with Joey Ryan. Yeah, I don't like pee-pee kissing. <laughs> so, well. There's my impression of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank but, the, but it's a pee-pee, not a microphone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is a little awkward exchange between both of us. I'm, I'm. You had Kevin Sullivan, like you yeah. goaded him into talking shit about me. So, but you're friends with the other Kevin. I'm friends with a lot of Kevins. So. Well, one Kevin in particular. You sound kind of like. Mm. Look at your. Is, mm. is it Nothing. Kevin Owens? Ding dong, ding ding ding. Not ding dong, ding ding. Like if you get like a game show, you get it right. What's wrong with ding, Kevin ding. Steen? Mm. T-shirt. Excuse me. Where's a T-shirt? I was talking to old guys. We don't. We don't like that. T-shirt talk. So you, we have you, T-shirt talk at, at. We get dinner early. You guys, what do you guys think of a, a wrestler wearing a T-shirt? And they'll go. Oh, no, no, no way. So, I have good. I wouldn't even think of asking what they thought if a wrestler kissed another wrestler's peepee. Well, you did. You asked Kevin Sullivan about it. Well, Kevin, he's into the he's you know he's the devil and stuff like that. He can handle it, but I wouldn't want to ask some of the old sweet old guys. And then you encouraged a fight between Lanny Poffo and Honky Tonk Man, which I, f- I kind of found a little disturbing. I'll be honest. Hey, got to make a buck. Got to make a buck sometimes, you know. Jesus, is that well? That's what I feel when I kiss a man on his wiener. Mm. You, so you can't relate to me. Mm. What's wrong? I don't relate. Hannibal. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess have you said everything. You want to you start the shoot interview or what? How did you get into wrestling? You're interviewing me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now nah, I'll use this feed too. I can borrow it. Please don't. Can you go behind that background? It's nicer for the YouTube. Please don't. Yeah. Okay. So how did you get into wrestling? Stop. I'm not. This is something. Not something I'm really interested. Where was your first match? Okay. We've all seen you on YouTube ask these questions. What was that territory like back then? A lot of people say it was very hard hitting. Do you believe? Do you, is that true? So now this is true that you don't even listen to the answers. Who was booking back then? You just say whatever you want to say. I've heard people say they could make upwards of two thousand dollars a week in that territory. And that's why that I feel my podcasts are a little more important. Is because was I, he ever stiff with you in the ring? Having a real conversation, not just asking these questions that. Now that drew money. A lot of these new guys can't draw any money. You know, they're all and they're all little, written you know, down in the same little basic tiny question. guys. I guess I do kind of talk about. I had a contract with WWE, people but it didn't up, work out. And I, t- I do yeah. want to know the background of people's families and how they got into wrestling. Dude, why? Why do you think Eric Bischoff was afraid to hire you? Those are the similarities. Do you think of yeah. my questions? But I'm always making sure I'm interacting. And I, I heard a rumor you were going to be WWF champion, I, I but, but a, Hogan nixed it. Is a that back true? and forth. Conversation. That, what was the original idea for you and your brother when you were going to the not, uh, WWF at just the time? Doesn't seem to be a back and forth conversation, which is what I liked. My did style. you prefer New York or Atlanta? And maybe that's why or, I haven't put the show on YouTube. And Philly, I mean Philadelphia. I would have loved to. Although have been it is there. now on Patreon. Paul Heyman once told me Hannibal, you would have been a natural here so, in Philadelphia. I guess if you do want to see the video, and, I'm, um, I am going into your territory. I mean, I, what Canada? I, no, YouTube. Oh. I'm going to take down those wrestle talk, those British guys. I read the Meltzer stuff, not them. All right, for legal purposes, that was not Hannibal. That was one of the great characters on Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling. It's a podcast. It's one of my favorite podcasts. Dare I call it my sister or brother podcast? That was the great Marty DeRosa doing one of the many characters he does every single week with his comedy partner, Sarah Shockey. Find it wherever you find podcasts. All right, let's get into the real talk with Will Ospreay. Oh, this is going to be also. This is going to be listened to in 2020. Oh, so this is going to be New Year. Happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, as and well. happy birthday, also. Happy birthday. Uh, I don't know. I'm assuming your birthday is from now until then. Okay. Oh, it probably is my. When, when is your birthday? My seventh. If you were to guess, my birthday. Are you my seventh as well? May six. Oh, same as my dad. My dad's born on the sixth. Were you his birthday present? Uh, I'm going to guess it was like a shock. It was probably just like he was out celebrating with a couple beers with his mates. And then all of a sudden my mom called him just going, I'm giving birth. You don't think that your dad was with your mom on the day, nah, the day nah. before that you were born? Nah, absolutely no. not. Nah, absolutely not. 
I don't think so. Anyway, is that anyway. is that real or I'm not? Gonna, no, I'm gonna have to ask him. I'm just gonna have to. Be, what was you doing? Uh, you think he was out on? Is he a typical? No, no, my British man. No, nah, my dad's just cool. My dad's just. I don't know. He's just a don, isn't he? I don't know what that means. Just, a don? Yeah, don. Uh, if, okay, first of all, if anyone was to say that, they, I would think he was an Italian member of a mafia. Okay, cool. Uh, like, yeah, uh, uh, no. What is the British lingo of Don? I don't know. Just a cool dude. Just a gangster. Just a my chav? dad's cool. No, my dad's not. A ch- I'm a chav, if anything. Are you? Like, yeah, I, oh, I don't know. I really don't know. I was, Why don't I you explain really... for everyone what a chav is? Oh, it's just like, I don't know. It must be like the epitome to like white trash for you guys. Just, I, I don't know. Just mm. Chav is just like someone who's like usual outfits are like track suits and just like baggy pants and like. Uh, just to- well, now that MJF, see, I think of Chaz, I think of Burberry. And MJF wears those. Really? Bur- I would have said he scarf. was a very smartly dressed man. Really? Yeah, I would have said he's very smartly dressed. I just think of Greg Burridge, who used to wear. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Greg's a chav. <laughs> right. Like, kind of, yeah. Greg's a chav. And he would wear all Burberry stuff. Would he? I've yeah. never seen him in Burberry ever. That was the gimmick, I thought, for no, wrestling. He was always in Adidas and Nike. Okay. Well, and they're like typical chav wear, I, I think, anyway. Are you from Essex? Yes. Are you really? Yes. Oh, I just guessed that. <laughs> yeah. I did. Well, it's the accent, isn't it? The- no. I mean, well, when I think of Chavs, I think of Essex. Yeah, I think exactly. that's because he sung but it like, in a song. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm so Parker. Yeah. You are a ch- No, Slag. slag you are a Slag. It. Yeah, Slag. Is, we're just doing it. all the British lingo. Yeah. You guys sung that. I actually remembered singing that word for word, like, because me and my mates would watch 1PW. Now, did you think that that was our song together? I thought Greg... F- probably suggested this would be funny and you just went along with it yeah i mean that was greg's song for like two years before we started teaming together <laughs> but i thought it was the team shag song yeah yeah yeah. that's the great part about it because it was such a great song yeah it was and, great and i don't know if you do you know people who do you know who've sang their own songs what would be the number one wrestler Shaw samuels i know that one because he did like um that was oh park life but instead it was Shaw's life or something is that right like that. he sang yeah. his own song yeah he sung his own song see i think of a, and a shout out to our friend rocky romero i think uh, that Rapun- yes that rapungi jam is pretty dude i actually said this to him i was like it's kind of cool because obviously like i i do love hip-hop and like i love singing and stuff like that and uh, able to download uh his song on the apple music and like normally you're just like, oh, it's my mate singing. I'll give him like a, a like or a retweet. But I generally like his album. I really <laughs> like it. Well, you know who is featured. Uh, on yes, that you one. are. Yes, thank the you. wise guru of t-shirt <laughs> selling. I see. I think it's cooler when like my friend Kip Russell, Kid Russell, who's a singer. He's saying that's what my song is. Boom, boom, cool. cool yeah, right. And he's my buddy from high school or uh, from life, you know. But you know, high school and so on. And whenever I get to do bigger shows, I think it's like, how cool is it that this guy's music? Is playing at Madison Square Garden. Oh whatever. yeah. So I think of that when I when 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 I went and watched. Uh, I think two years ago I was with DDT and I we were wrestling in Japan and then I watched. Um, it was one where you did the, maybe it was last year where you did the moonsault off of the, the the, oh, the Tokyo Trust- Dome show. Oh yeah, Tokyo Dome. Yeah. Was that last year? Yes, that was. Oh, yeah. I mean, last, yeah. Okay. This year was me and Ibushi. Last year was the four way. Yeah, it was. Okay. And I'm just like Rocky's coming out with. Re- to like that music's being played in front, in front of, like, of 50, 50, 000, yeah, people, whatever it is. Just, yeah, I thought that was cool as well. Like, I felt the same where Madison Square Garden, because like this guy just wrote a song about me. It was just like at one point the song goes, Oh spray, oh spray. I was just like, cool. It literally feels like I'm my own rock star, like Kevin from uh uh It Lives It Breeze, but now he's a part of a uh, Damnation, which is great album, uh great uh not great album, great artist, sorry. That's and the guy who made your song? Uh, yeah, the, the guys that made my song, Kevin, is just amazing voice. And we had problems with it a little while ago because uh, th- there's something between them and the label. I, I never understood because in my mind, the guy that sung it and the guy that produced it has given us permission for it. But there was something with the label. But they've managed to sort it out, so we got it back. I just didn't want anyone else singing my theme song. Just He's got such a unique voice. I think he's just one of the best singers I've ever seen. Uh, also, I would love the idea of a band named Kevin. I know it's probably. Oh, no, no. It's, it's Damnation. <laughs> I I would like, I, if I was to start That's a band, cool. I think I'd call my band Kevin. Of course, Steve. Frank. Yeah. Kevin and Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin and Steve. Um, oh, you were a hip hop head, but you didn't want a hip hop music. No, I just like all music. I like, like, I mean, I like my boy bands. I like uh, my rap music. I love hip hop. Love ABBA. Oh, God, I love ABBA. I went karaoke the other night. You were Karaoke? Nowhere, you were nowhere to be found. I'm not on this tour. Well, got some time off for once. <laughs> for this year, I finally got some time off. Right. 
Well, we've you've been missed. Uh, okay, so you said that you, uh, your parents, you're uh, you're from Essex. Yep. What kind of what kind of your dad's cool? My dad's so cool. Your mom's cool. Mom's lovely. My <laughs> mom is the best. What's what was growing up in Essex like? That's just cool. Just uh, usual. I've had like an amazing childhood. Just, okay. Mom and dad looked after me. Uh, but we were always known as like the neighbors from hell. Just because uh, who's we? My my family. Okay, it's just you. No, my family. Uh, like my dad was cool because he's just like my dad's just. My is it dad. just you three growing up, or do you? Have yeah, yeah. Well, uh, us three, but uh, so story is my mum owns a, a drama group, like a uh, amateur productions, like p- pantomime. She does at the Queen's Theatre and done the West End twice, and both times sold out. Yeah, my mum is awesome. My mum's so cool. Shh. Writes shows, produces them, directs them, sings. Everything. Uh, she used to like. Uh, I was on stage. Uh, in her belly, like singing. So you grew up going to these shows. Yes. And there's probably a lot of about that. You could probably go. That's why you like the way you are. Like, okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah. My mom uh, would just produce all these shows and just. Were you a theater around. kid? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I was a theater kid. Used to, I used to be able to sing. Like, I mean, I can't sing, but I can hold a note, but uh, I, I was more of a dancer. Like my mom would, uh, bring in dancers to our um to our drama group to like teach us how to do stuff and then one day like i just picked it up really easy i was a very good ballroom dancer you know how you see pictures of like all these like young wrestlers like like and then their kids like hang out with andre the giant or hulk hogan yes and like like as a fan i'm just like oh man i'd, I'd kill them why didn't i get to be able to hang out with Paul Andre. Orndorff or whatever. Yeah. Was that you with like the stars of the London theater? No, no, absolutely not. Like I, I couldn't give a toss who they were. I just generally just. But I'm saying, were they stars? No, of course they weren't stars. They like, were. Not- it was literally just like the kids that like no one was paid to be in the group. My mum, it was like a amateur drama group, and people of the community of like where I'm from, Raynham. Uh, would come do these shows and it'd be like pantomimes like Cinderella like Jack and the Beanstalk no it wasn't stuff. larger than like you said they no, did the West End but they did yeah they so they did the West End twice my mum which in my head is that's like Broadway and yes I, it is yeah, yeah. Okay. but like uh, my mum because our we would do shows at the Queen's Theatre which is a local uh, theater, which is like a 500 seater. Oh, that's it. It, out, it like, sounded so big. No, no, but in to my be head fair, it was 50,000 people. No, oh no, it's not 50,000, <laughs> but like my mum would do like one night at the Queen's Theatre, one year sellout. Next time she'd do two shows, sellout. So she'd be doing like four nights in a row at the Queen's Theatre, sellout, different crowds, different people all the time. So when one day my mum was just like, ah, oh, I'm just going to do uh, the West End. I'm just going to give it a go. She uh, hired out the London Palladium, which is like a uh, 2,000 seater and like sold it out doing her own show, like her own show that she produced. And then she did another one at the Savoy Theatre in 2013 maybe maybe 2012 oh, so you were around for this stuff yeah i was around yeah, I was yeah around. did you like, help did you do anything i was just more or less a dancer my mum would direct me do whatever i need <laughs> i would dance i would sing if i need to but i'm not really that much of a singer like i can hold a note but if you ask me to like go any higher than what i can do then like it just sounds awful all right what did your dad do uh my dad was an electrician okay yeah my dad was just but like he was a very good handyman so did you pick up that stuff yeah, well, like to be fair, I tell this story a while ago, but um, I would go to work with my dad because, like, I didn't graduate in anything, and like, I didn't get any of the grades I wanted. Maybe like one B and a C, and everything else I failed. So I had to go to work with my dad. And, Hold on, uh, you didn't graduate high school? No. Oh no, I, I mean I did, but like I didn't get the grades I wanted to go to college. Okay. Like I was never given the grades or anything along those lines because you were so attention. quick to say no i did not graduate high school though. yeah but like i'm a no dumbass so, yeah, <laughs> like, so, uh, uh, so you're yeah. saying after high school you went to work with your dad yeah like i mean at first it was with my uncle uh doing masticking which is like the rubber seals around your bathrooms and windows i would do that and then i'd work with my dad doing the electrician stuff afterwards because that, that's got a little bit boring and repetitive for me so doing that with my dad and i needed my weekends to obviously do the independence but like, you know, I've never gone to an electrician course or anything like that. My dad would have shown me how to do it and then I would do it. But I have blown up so many people's kitchens. It is unreal. <laughs> like, and instead of like being like, put my hands up. Oh, sorry. That was my fault. I'll just run off. I'll just be like, no, see you later. I'm, so just d- leave people without a kitchen. <laughs> dad lost a lot of jobs because of it. <laughs> no, my dad come in and fix it. But I was just like, no, I don't know what I did. I just yeah. put up a kitchen. Oh, I did uh, construction for my friend in high school. How was that? And uh, I... For some reason, construction meant sweeping up houses and mowing lawns. 
So I mowed. That, a, I'm it's not construction. Not construction, no. but it was sold to me as construction. It's not. But I, I like mowed the guy's lawn, and then I broke his uh, lawnmower, and then I ran away and never came back. To yeah, work. that's yeah. what you just do. That's the that is the man thing to do. So it is, I, it is just you. break something. Uh, Walk away and then come back the next day and go, who's done that? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> mate, uh, I put my whole foot, my foot through so many ceilings oh. and just, just walk home, go uh, on. We, we, you would know how to fix it or you don't? No, of course not. That's but why you've I go been, on. you've been learned. You've no, been trained. I don't, just, I mean, it goes in one ear, one out the did, other. Did your dad make your backyard wrestling rings? Uh, yeah. So my mum and dad knew a welder. They'd help make. Their, they knew a welder. Yeah. So then, like, they of course had, like, they do for stage idea. stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But like my dad i guess would like have a rough idea how it was and they'd think oh it must be a spring underneath so they put like a car spring underneath the ring what's that well it like you know like a car hydraulic spring like what'd you call it a cars a cast car car okay car. but i'm sorry i'm so english <laughs> but uh i'm so essex that's not even english uh but then that broke, so you had to get like, it was like a monster truck spring like underneath the ring so it was so bouncy we would hit this ring and fly off I've owned three wrestling rings in my life. All homemade? Or one bought. homemade and then two bought. What did you do with the homemade one after you, you finished Homemade it? one, uh, because, so it wasn't like your average wrestling rings. So your average wrestling rings is like bars, right? This was like four posts and then two giant welded together pieces that you needed for four blokes right. to like lift it up and then screw it into place. Uh because you're just guessing. You don't know the schematics. Yeah, we don't know. Right. We don't know. We're just a bunch of kids backyard wrestling. So, I mean, there's some money put into that. So once you're like, oh, wait, we want to buy a real ring. Uh, so we got like- You just scrapped we, the other no, one? No, we set up a youth group. So like we set up a youth group and we were just like uh, saying basically we wanted to keep kids off street so we'd teach them how to wrestle and stuff like that. And then- uh, At what age was this? 14. <laughs> like generally, like we, we were. It was just like we wanted to like do like a community wrestling yeah. class. Yeah. So I was able to like get some youth funding and just like- uh, Really? Yeah, I'm not even joking. Lady gave us two grand. We put up a wrestling ring and we would teach kids to come and wrestle. We didn't know how to wrestle. Of course. But like, I mean, like I knew like, because we went to like a school called Dropkicks and they taught us like the basics, like how to bump, how to chain wrestle. But then like they would never teach us anything above that because like we're kids. Yeah. So we was like heavily into backyard wrestling. And when this guy was like, yeah, if you want to teach kids to- keep them off the street and teach them how to wrestle and stuff like that. Yeah, we'll help you out. We'll give you two grand, Bosch. And then we got a new ring. Dude, it was, we had such a cool, Unreal. cool right, well, community. Where was the first fascination with wrestling? Was it right away? Yeah, as soon as my dad showed me with it. it was, I remember, Did your dad like, like wrestling? Yeah, my dad loved it. I love Mr. Perfect. Like, I think Did was, your dad's dad like wrestling? No, no. My, <laughs> uh, do, uh, my dad's adopted. So like, he doesn't know who his real dad is. He what? actually found out his surname like, a few years ago and he's never he looked at it ripped it up put it in the bin <laughs> well i think mean, growing up in his house um no like he was a dog dude so like i i don't really i can he, remember like bits but like not really much of like but my, he just started watching bits. wrestling then and then uh, passed it I, on to you I, do you know what i don't know how it came about like, if i had to ask he probably watched like the wos world of sport era maybe like every now and again because that's my granddad would actually be like, yeah, I remember Big Daddy, but that was about right. it. That's what all British yeah, people say. Yeah, that's what they all say, right? <laughs> but yeah, my dad had just a VH tape of uh, like the Legion of Doom were on the cover. And that was all I remember of it. And then it was like Mr. Perfect versus Texas Tornado. So okay. that was like, that was like one of the first like, no. Uh, so we were channel hopping first and we saw Triple H in a cast beat the rock up in a cage. Like, I can't remember what the story was, but my dad was like, oh, yeah, I've actually, like, I go down to the boot sale all the time. Like, it's loads of guys with their cars and they would just sell stuff. He's like, yeah, this guy sells wrestling videos all the time. I was like, can you get me some? Like, I'd love this. Because it was on, like, a, on like Fridays or Mondays. Yeah. See, like, in my head, your, your first wrestling match, like, you ever saw was, like, Chris Saban and, and, versus Alex Shelley or something. After the fascination, <laughs> yeah, but, like. So you so do have that, early days of that generation. Oh, well, yeah. But yeah. like, so the first thing I ever saw was that like, Triple H and Rock. Then my dad would take me to the past and be like, Mr. Perfect versus Texas Tornado. Mm -hmm. Then after getting into WWE, like finding out about the, the invasion angle, like, oh, there's a WCW. So I'd watch the WCW Cruiserweights. That's where my fascination lie with like Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio doing it. But then when they did the invasion angle and after that, I just fell out of love with wrestling because there was just nothing else. There was no competition. There was nothing. And then my mate introduced me to TNA, which was the wrestling channel, which is actually where I first saw you yeah. with Ring of Honor. 
because you were there was always those cool introduction videos. I had a thirty second commercial on. Yeah, there. yeah. yeah. It was like, and the music went. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh my god, that is it. Did I did I bring it back there? Yeah, you actually did. The first one I saw was the Austin Aries one because uh, I think it was, his song was like "Reach Out and Touch." Uh-huh. And it was like doing all these cool four fifties, and then your music came. No, it was like you then uh, Jack Evans, mm-hmm. and then then it was your one. Yeah, and that's when I first saw you because the one PW shows would come on the wrestling channel as well, but. When AJ Styles did the Springboard Shooting Star Press, I was like, I want to be a wrestler, mum. Uh, on what? On a Ring of Honor show or no, the British T- show he did? Uh, or TNA? TNA. It was him, Daniels, and Joe. Gotcha. Because it was on the wrestling channel. Now, uh, were, you, were you a flippy kid? I, or you, you like, attributed to dance? I was a dancer, but like my mum had obviously like a trampoline in my back garden. Uh, and watching the WCW Cruiserweights, so I was able to just do the flips. And near my trampoline was like a swimming pool. And on the swimming pool, there's a like a ledge that went round it, like like decking. Uh, so I just always bite my trampoline up to the ledge and just do shooting star presses okay. off a ledge. So I was like, like, always able to do it. Like, why didn't you look at The Rock or Triple H and be like, "I want to be a wrestler"? I thought they were cool, but I just I was always a fan of like the the ability to be like a Power Ranger, something I guess, like Spider Man, because Spider Man was a huge <laughs> influence as a kid. So you thought you could be more Spider Man? I generally think I than... am Spider Man when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, like, I was climbing up walls like. There's a story actually in my school that my mum hates. It's just like me climbing up on like a goal post, like a, a soccer ball post, like climbing up on it and moonsaulting off, landing on my feet. Uh, I got on top of my school's assembly whole roof like once, just like climbed up on everything and was like climbing on the side of buildings. I was up like a five-story building just on top of the roof. Now, do you do this out. inspired by wrestling or inspired by... Just being a dumbass, I think, just trying to impress my mates. Okay, because me and my friends would kind of do the same thing off the football posts onto, like, crash pads. But in my head, I was always like, I'm New Jack or I'm, like, <laughs> super crazy moonsaulting off of it or whatever. Uh, I mean, probably when I was young, I was probably thinking to myself, oh, I'm, like, I don't know, who's the cruiserweights? Paul London. Paul London was, yeah. cool, like, I'm Paul London doing moonsaults. But uh, I think it was after that era like because i would watch it but not religiously i think it was when i was like 15 and someone showed me dragon gate and i was just in awe of it i was but so okay so let's go back to you get funding for this and you make this yes you make this ring yeah well no we bought a ring so like we bought a ring uh and we actually did shows as well so we would put shows on but is that after you saw dragon gate and aj styles uh after i saw aj styles but like, so we watch AJ. I'm trying to remember because when we were backyard wrestling, there were things called like feds. So there was like we had the ter- the territory in Raynham, which is my one, and this we had is the all- territory in Luton, which was different wrestlers. And is like, this was- all based off the internet? Or are you finding each other off the internet? Yeah, we had like a forum. Okay, we generally like this which was off of what UKBYW. This- oh, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, were you Wait, there? UKFF. No, no. So like that, but UKBYW okay. forum. Okay. And there were other backyarders, obviously, all around England, and we would make music videos and put them on the forum, and people would like critique us. Yeah. But like people with no wrestling experience whatsoever, someone would like always be like sloppy lock up, sloppy <laughs> okay. wrist lock, good drop kick. Like now, how many of those people are in wrestling, or or did had? Uh, was there a handful? Mark Andrews was on the. UK BYW, Flash Morgan Webster was on it, uh, Wild Boar was on it. Like a lot of, uh, Puck was on it, I think. Yeah. Puck, Martin Stone, uh, <laughs> he was on it. Uh, God damn. Uh, Paul Robinson. Because uh, I always think that like these people, you have to come from somewhere. Yeah, you do. <laughs> we, we were just kids that just generally liked wrestling, but we just didn't take it seriously enough. In mm-hmm. fact, um, there's a story I think that went around, like when Pac left Dragon Gate and was going to go to WWE. He went up to Quilden and was, uh, Quilden was like, Andy hey, Quilden who yeah, runs Rev Pro. Yes. Yeah. And he was like, where am I going to get guys who can do your flips? And he introduced them to my back, like to his backyard friends who could do it all. And they was like, and he said, uh, if you come train with me, I'm going to train you, put you on my shows. And they went, nah. And they could do like the most ridiculous stuff, like running 630s and stuff like that. Like generally backyarding was the coolest thing. So there's the a whole crew out there who can backyards. do all the stuff. Who don't want to be on shows or be don't want to make money from it? Just, to, <laughs> just wanted to do it for fun because I, they they didn't think it was real. 
like in a weird way. I don't how, know. How do we goat them into the into the world? Well, they got to train with them, Shima's got to go get them. And uh, maybe, <laughs> but like, I mean, I convinced one of them to come back. I had Chris Saban go up to one of my mates because the backyarders came to one of my shows, and I was actually facing Pete Dunn. Chris Saban was on it, and I was just talking to Chris, and I was saying, Ash, man, give it a go. Like it's actually done. So you should just come back into it. You got natural athleticism. You'll do fine here. He was like. Uh, if you can convince someone of like a bigger name to do it, then yeah, I'll do it. And I went, Saban, tell my mate Ash to get back into wrestling. And Saban looked in deadly eyes and went, come back to wrestling. And he went, all right, that's enough. <laughs> so, and he's in? Yeah, he got back into the indie scene. I don't know what he's doing now. Actually, no, he's having a kid now. Well, so I don't know if he's still wrestling, but I've, I think he might be. Were there 50-year-old backyarders? 50-year-old backyarders. Yeah. There was- Who's no, the oldest backyarder? Oh, who's the oldest backyard? Maybe just someone of like 30 or something like that. I don't know. I didn't really know people's age. Like. I was a 16, uh, 14, 16 year old kid hanging around with these like guys. And it, I, it kind of makes me laugh now. I think about it. Cause like, uh, obviously my friend introduced me to backyard wrestling and like, there was a forum and stuff like that. And I said to my mum once, I was like, just got ringing the backyard. I was like, mum, can I have some friends around to play wrestling? And she was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Go on. And like these like 25 year old men were coming <laughs> around like a 14 year old's kid's yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. And my mum was like, who are you and why are you hanging around my son? I was like, oh, we're just doing some wrestling. They had video cameras and stuff like that. So my mom was like freaked yeah. out. But uh, out of the reason why we called the neighbors from hell is because obviously we had the police called on us like so many times because they thought we was running an underground boxing club. <laughs> and the moment when my mom went, it's wrestling. They went, oh, never mind. Then. There you go. <laughs> so they thought it was less dangerous. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's, yeah. Um, so did you, so how did you get convinced to get into real wrestling? And by real wrestling, I mean fake wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one where we make money. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> I, after like a little while back, yard and I saw something, it just horrified me. And I kind of, I was like, why are we doing this? Like, this is so stupid. In the backyard? Yeah. So uh, someone did a top rope superplex and in a proper ring, 18 foot ring, it was actually really good from like monster rings and cages, got it shipped over to the England. So uh, this guy was just rich. Cost, I was going to say cost a pretty penny. Yeah. yeah, probably a lot. And the guy did top rope suplex from the a little tippy tippy top to the floor onto mm. the field. Mm. Like, and the guy that took it was fine. The guy giving it folded up like a mm. motherfucker. And I just, I don't know. I was just put off by it because I was like, he could have died. Uh, so I said, oh, I'm not going to do it. But because I put so many music videos out, it caught Greg Burridge's attention. Now I know Greg from like when I used to do chain wrestling and drop kicks, like, mm -hmm. but Greg has always kind of kept an eye on me. And he was just like, Hey, what are you doing now? I was like, ah, to be honest, I'm just kind of giving up on wrestling. I'm 17 now. I should really consider like just actually getting a job. And he was just like, no, you're not. I've started a school in Bethnal Green. Come down. You'll love it. What was your dream going to be? Had he not called you? I still wanted to be a wrestler, but I just thought it was just like, Oh, I need to wait till I'm 18 and move to America. Or something like that. I don't know the logistics of moving to America. Uh, I but think. what was the plan? Go I, where? I don't know. Like, I just thought I was just going to- Go where? Work. I don't know. I don't know. I AJ's don't, house? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> if you'd have me. If you'd have me. I don't know. But you hadn't researched it all? No, You're, I just don't know. I just, I, I'm not that type of kid that researches stuff. I just go with the flow. Okay. So uh, you were, it was always wrestling then? Yeah, it was always wrestling. But like, I, I would still backyard with my friends, like in my territory. Uh, But yeah, I'd- Back go with my friends, and then Greg introduced me. He showed me like, oh, this is like what we do. We did you train masks. at Lucha Britannica? Yes, Lucha London School of Lucha Libre. It's still going to this day now, and they still do the Lucha Britannia shows. Mm -hmm. um, but, I said Britannica. Yes, it's Britannia. Britannia. Britannica Britannia. is the encyclopedia. Um, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Greg showed me like I was under a mask. I was working with my friend Paul Robertson, who was a backyarder as well. So we worked off one another and they put me as his evil twin brother, Dark Britannico. And we would just wrestle each other all the time and people wanted to know who the guy was under the mask and British wrestling was growing and growing. My first show was in front of a thousand people. Get fucked. Yeah. First Where uh, at? paid gig. Uh, Elephant and Castle Brit Rest Fest. It was 2012. Uh, had Doug Williams on it. Had Because that's the thing, like, I've, I did live shows. Like I made my own shows, like when we had the youth group and the maximum people we ever got in a venue was like 80 people. So I was like, this is wrestling guys. Mm -hmm. Like this is the level. And then like 
Greg was like, oh, yeah, come to the show. And when I walked into the venue, I was like, oh, God, this is a big venue for 80 people. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. they did like the group meeting and Alex Shane was there and all those guys. And he went, okay, guys, thanks for doing this. This is once again, it's a charity event. All the tickets are going to like a charity and blah, 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 blah. So we're expected to get a thousand people in today. I went to beg your fucking pardon. Yeah. Like, and oh, my you God. Who'd you wrestle? Me, Greg Burridge, Paul Robinson, and Santeria, we did like a Lucha Britannia showcase. Gotcha. And uh, I think, because there was a lot of people there, like FPW was there and Progress was there and uh, just quite a few guys were there at the time. And I just see some like skinny 18-year-old kid do a 630. So you broke out all the stuff. Yeah, everything. We stole the show that night. I don't care. We stole the show. Everyone was just being... Just doing the stuff. It was just like every now and again, like the biggest move as a Death Valley driver. Mm. Me and Paul Robinson were doing deja vus, getting Greg Burrish to give me like power bombs and shit like that. But then they just saw a kid do a 630 and they was like, we need him now. So then this was like the current, everyone was like making promotions in British wrestling. And I think everyone was like, all right, who's the guy under the mask? And I didn't really have an identity. At the time, my backyard name was Ace Payne. I was like, I can't have that as a name. It's a great name. Though. No, it can't. It can't. <laughs> so then I went, all right, well, what's your real name? And I went, Billy. And it was like, we can't call you Billy. He went, why can't we call you Billy? It was like, what's your real name? I was like, William. And then they was like, uh, sounds posh, not really posh. Will. And then, okay, what's your surname? I was like, Osprey. And I went, oh my God, that's a bird. So I was like, yeah. So Will Osprey was born, but. I just remember Greg telling me you just need something more to connect with crowds and stuff like that. You need to think of like what's cool outside of wrestling. Mm -hmm. And then for me, the coolest thing at the time was Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, oh, if I wear the Assassin's Creed jacket, maybe I'm cool. And that's what got you. See, uh, we we met at uh, FPW. Uh, was it FPW? Yes. That's the, well, I want to say Rev Pro for in Bournemouth or whatever that's called. My. Uh, Swan. I don't. What Swan? is FPW? FPW. You did one show there because I remember. I think you hated me because I said to you like because everyone was doing the river like, watch it, wherever your favorite film is. Will hasn't seen it, so now I would go across the room and just be like, "Hey man, what's your favorite film?" And they would go like, "Uh, uh, I don't, I don't even know what it's called anymore, but whatever." That's and then I went to you and I went, "What's your favorite film?" And you would say it, and I went, haven't seen it. And you went, you prick, <laughs> like in front of the entire locker room. I was like, oh, no, I've upset Cole Cabana. But no, you are right, actually. The first time I met you was like uh, in RevPro because then you started the feud with Shah Samuels. I was going to say, it was the, it was, and I just remember you hopping around the ring yeah. beforehand. Yeah. And I remember with being with Andy Golden, and, and I'm like, who is this guy? And he's just like, oh, he's a man of many flips. Like, <laughs> he was like, even that. And he was just like kind of explaining you to me being like he's very young he's gonna be really good or you oh you said that yeah yeah, yeah but he's into many of flips and you were doing just like everything stunt work but this was before the show you were just like doing stunt work like you were literally what in the ring that? does that make sense i just don't remember us. right I, I do for some reason i remember you in the ring but i don't remember what fpw was uh i don't remember that promotion sorry uh it's okay you have yeah. nothing to feel bad about. Yeah, just I I thought that was just funny just because like, I was doing that whole theme. What's your favorite film? Haven't seen it. And then I pointed to oh. you and I was like, I kind of went, oh, God, no. Like, I don't want to come across as a dick. Wait, but, but the didn't. joke was, I think it's in Surrey. And I said that you said sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, my and bad. I said, it's okay. <laughs> it's the don't accent again. Bad. I'm sorry. But, Wait, yeah, I I'm remember sorry. wrestling in Surrey. I just don't remember what FPW was. Future Pro Wrestling. I know. Why can't I remember that? Uh, there was three dudes that run it. One was a bull dude. One was a bigger lad and one looked like he worked in an office yep no, no i knew it no one of those dudes <laughs> like one of them but yeah just yeah you are right though rev pro was the first time I right. met you, and you was in knee deep in the feud with Shah samuels at that point and i actually watched that match and that was one of my favorite favorite matches because uh just watching you and Shah because i was like well the american would win a british title <laughs> like, of course not and then when you won it i was like God, I'm such a fan. Ah. Like, <laughs> well, so so, how did you think you developed into, or, or tell me your stages of like, right? We all have these points in our career where we feel like stuff has moved. If that makes sense, like I like the British wrestling boom. No, I, in your own career, like like I, I like you, you're you know like you've made uh, some kind of switch and you've gone to another level and then you've gone to another level and that's what your career will be is all these levels. 
Uh, so the first one, you're just starting out. You're on these shows. Yeah, you're wrestling just sort of starting. Um, uh, I think my thing is more like learning experiences. Like, so I would always wrestle British guys, no matter what. I never got in the ring with an American. The first American I got in the ring with, and I think this was at the time when he was at his hottest. Like he was winning belts left, right, and center. Uh, was Ricochet? It was the first like foreigner I ever got in the ring with. And where was that at? RevPro. And so before that match, were you wrestling? All the shows or all the Ref Pro shows, yeah. I mean, all the shows in England. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah. I mean, not all of them, but like the London-based ones, yes. Okay. I just didn't like traveling. I just, I don't like traveling ever. Okay. But um, yeah, I was just doing like all the London ones, like Progress. I was doing. I was doing FPW, Ref Pro, Lucha Britannia, uh, my own little promotion that I was like helping run and stuff like that. But yeah, he was the first guy and in my mind i said to myself like okay this is now like this is where i'm gonna learn because i got in the ring with guys like haskins and i would learn from that then i'd get in the ring with project ego which was martin kirby and chris travis god rest his soul uh and i would learn from the top british guys but like i think for me to take it to the next level for like i wanted to learn the pwg style and like do you know what i mean but that, that was cool at the time yeah. the pwg it's so crazy that that's a st- that like I know it is, yeah. You but know, just to I mean? hear someone say that. I mean, we are. So, I mean, we're wrestling in the same era, yeah. But we're in different eras of wrestling, kind of, yeah. Right. So I, I mean, just like you know, I'm. I've got whatever. What are you twenty six? Twenty six. Twenty six. Right. So I'm almost you know fourteen years. Like I've gone through different independent eras, and by the time I kind of got deep into what I was in, you stop. You start hearing that those like street names. You know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. PWG stuff. Like the TNA <laughs> kick. Right, like, right, right. You know, I was a little, I was in I was in it when I heard that, but you know, I'm so fixated in what I'm doing, I guess now is I I think it's like where the hotbeds of pro wrestling mm-hmm. were, right? So in my opinion, at that time of my career, it was 2013 maybe, and I think PWG was the hottest mm-hmm. thing. And I was just like, okay, like this is the style that I want to learn. So like and Trevor was love Ricochet was lovely. Cause he's just the nicest dude ever. And he was just, I would say, look today, I know nothing, but I can do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> I was like, I want to learn. He said, what can you do? And I went, the coolest thing I can do is a 630. That is the coolest thing. He was like, oh, so can I. So like, it was like, I'll get your 630 in, but I'm finishing you with my 630. And it was just, it was so cool. And what'd you do? Did you go go through a list of the moves and then and things? No, I, it do? was just like, well, this is what I do. And then he would go like, what would you like to do here? And I would, I would say something, but it was like, okay, do you know what will make it better? This. And I'd go, yep, I'm going to do it. Like, I did a satellite DDT, and like, I don't think I've ever done a satellite DDT in my life at that point, but I was just like, yeah, I can do it because mm-hmm. you've told me to do it. Because mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't part of the move set, the right. arsenal. And then you watched how he placed, what he placed, where yeah. he placed. And then right? I, yeah, because he wasn't obviously a regular in England, and like, there was no such thing as an on demand service at this point, it was just DVDs, I would do all of Ricochet's moves. Mm -hmm. I would literally take that structure. I would do his moves. I would like do his combos. And And then he would tweet it to you. And he would tweet me saying, stop doing my moves. (laughs) And then I had Jimmy Havoc one day pull me to one side and go like, look, it's amazing that you can do this stuff, but now it's good to know that you're Ricochet, but now we need to find Will. And and that's when I went, okay. So instead I just took aspects of like every like match era or every era of wrestling that I ever loved and kind of put it. How does your brain make up moves does it i don't know my my brain does i don't know like so here's something funny yeah like, just for a little funny side note and everyone like everyone i've told this so far has gone yeah we know i didn't know so i did a test last week i have adhd i never knew come on that's a good i, I never knew <laughs> I what'd you do the test knew. on online uh, no so uh, not online so i called a doctor first and then he sent over this verified test thing and then like i was on the phone to him doing the test as well like clicking yes and no and whatever blah 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 turns out i have adhd yeah never knew i had to pay 30 dollars for it as well 30 dollars to be told that everyone something <laughs> everyone already knew did he medicate you he, he, he said if you want medication we can get it i was like oh, i kind of like who i am though Here you go. like i mean <laughs> yeah i don't think i should be in any more medication anyway <laughs> just if you're in but, seventh um, grade it might be all right yeah, <laughs> but like yeah my brain just i don't know like uh now my brain works a little bit, I mean, not the best, but like still better than what it was, just just understanding how to place. But I think that is just, what, what, what do you mean by coming up moves or coming up with match structure? 
No, not necessarily match drug, but it's just, uh, you know, I, th- I think if I was to say PWG style, it's kind of a, a little bit about innovation, right? Yes. And it's a, it's about, I, I, it's funny to, to bring up dance, but, you know, like these matches have kind of become a bit of a dance where you just, these yeah. sequences are what makes the people kind of go crazy. Yes. So I guess it's not so much the actual move, but the sequences that my brings is, the move to life. Yeah. I think my thing is now is just, as long as the sequence like looks like I'm going for at least something, then like, then that's where I think, I think like I kind of like connect in a weird way. Just, I don't but know. do you, do you, I mean, when you're going into a match, do you see it happening? Or like, if you have, you know, have a match coming up, are you visioning it? Yeah, like for or are example, you just watching yeah. some shit and hoping yeah. something ex- inspires you. A uh, little bit of both, a little bit of both. Like so I get inspired on just like weird things now, but I don't know. I think back then, like I, I try and remember like that moment when I was a kid. But I think I generally was just along the lines of just I want to wrestle and I just want to get this movie and get this movie. I didn't really care about selling or I didn't care about like movement. I was like, as long as I look at a camera after i do a move then like then that's cool right that's facials isn't it like yeah. just I, I don't know but like i think it was like wrestling ricochet then i got to wrestle like more for us like, I, I had matt seidel's first match back in england i wrestled aj styles as the iwgp heavyweight champion i wrestled kenny omega i wrestled in bowler uh i had like a real cool story with jimmy in progress which i think kind of was like the real learning of like a story so like i had these like ups and downs and dips and dives do you remember the time where because obviously you, you're wrestling ricochet and you're like oh my god ricochet like teach me and then you're like oh my god i'm sure matt seidel yeah teach uh, me yeah right but is there a moment where you felt as an equal in the ring with these guys if no. that makes sense like, <laughs> no, I, I still, <laughs> no dude even to this day like i still don't think i belong here i feel like i'm gonna set up a ring in my garden soon just do a backyard show I, I still have to pinch myself so you still don't you still don't see it as like two equal partners going at it no i still think i'm learning like all the time like even now like if i ever say like oh you got okada next week like i still am just like okada teach me like yeah you know what i mean just i and and so when, well the first time you wrestled and you, you i mean like actually sorry sorry to cut you off yeah. my apologies but like when i'm like in the ring like now if I'm doing like an independent with a guy who's like once in my position, correct. I want to try and get the best out of him. So of now course. I feel like it's my responsibility to try and teach that style to him. Just because I do feel like now I do, this is going to sound stupid, but I do think that match with Ricochet from the best of super juniors did inspire a lot of people in that style. But yeah. like, I think they kind of was like, are we going to do this in times by 10? But like, it was, Oh well, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. Please stop it. Please stop. But then, like, <laughs> and I got like a kid in England that I'm teaching. Like, when I'm over there anyway, and he sends me his matches. Like, and I I do sometimes. I'm like, oh, stop running. Just stop. Just yeah. sell and just like, you know, just little things like that. So like, but it takes experiences for those. Yeah, guys. but like for me, it's like I would like to teach him that side of things because like that's obviously when I faced Okada the first time. Like I saw an opportunity to learn from him and he was just like, okay, hit, sell, stay. And like, I would suggest all these moves and he'd go like, no, just one. So then I have to be like, ah, this one. Like, do you know what I mean? Just, and he would tell me why it would make sense and et cetera, et cetera. So. And he saw something in you or you became friends or you had a good match or what? I, do you know what? I don't like, we had a good match, but like, I think it was half, half the reason was like, uh, Tago Tori was in the crowd watching. I had Gator ringside. I had uh, just all the boys, like Tanahashi was watching behind the curtain. And then, like, as soon as the match finished, apparently Tanahashi went straight to her Tori and was like, You need to get him. He's like a white coat or a bushi. Nice. So I thought that was very lovely of him. And then uh, that happened because uh, my dad that year had a heart attack. And I was contemplating just like stopping wrestling just because I was like, I need to be able to provide for my family because I can't be an electrician now because my dad's like, my dad was the sole reason I could go to work. So then I got like a job plus doing the indies, but it was like getting to the point where like my wrestling, even though I was wrestling a lot, I wasn't really earning money. It wasn't merchandise. I wasn't really a thing on. And you're pretty famous for being shit with money also. Yes. Very famous (laughs) for being shit with money. If I could. If I could instill anything in you, yes. I will. I'll try, but uh, but I know to be found better now. Okay, uh, but 
yeah, so my dad had like a heart attack. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'm, if I don't hear anything from this year, because my friends were being signed. So I was like, it wasn't impossible, but I just think it, they're not going to look at a skinny white kid. Like then they're, they're not going to look at me. I'm not tanned. I'm not buff. I don't have a six pack. In fact, they were like skinny boy abs. So I was just like, I don't know, just I think I'll knock it on the head and maybe I'll go to college or see if I can like redo my exams or something like that. But I think Okada put me over. They said they'll bring me over to Super Juniors. So I was like, cool. And then the month after, uh, WWE offered me the Cruiserweight Classic. So I was like, oh, cool. And they said, oh, you can do both if you want. You can do the Super Juniors and that. So I was like, oh, amazing. And then Impact offered me a deal. Uh, and then it was AJ. Nakamura and all that left and New Japan needed to sign guys and Okada literally just went to sign Will yeah <laughs> and then I think WWE heard about that and then they offered me a full time deal so then that was the point where I was like oh who do I go to like I, d- I don't know but then all the guys that I saw were like the cool guys in NXT came from New Japan so then I was kind of like oh I think it's the right decision to go to New Japan and the real selling point for me was because at the time I'm 22 I'm still a little bit of a kid uh, and this r- real selling point was you go there you do a show you come home you go there you do a tour you come home so then I think that I'm still I'm a home guy and WWE was moved to Florida yeah, moved to Florida yeah. train with us every day practice your entrance yeah. practice your promo did you have someone that you that's a big decision especially at 22 did you uh, did you confine in anybody my friend Paul, I can find him. My friend Sam, I can find him. And my missus as well. Like me and my missus just started seeing each other at that point as well. And did everyone, was everyone kind of like that, your choice is the right choice or were people? F- I think my mum was along the lines of like, I don't know what a new Japan is. <laughs> I know what WWE is. Go there. Right. But like, obviously being the nerd that I am, I was like, yeah, no, but guys go there and they don't get on TV or they don't make it. It's like, I'm a no one still. I'm just some British kid. I need to go and do something else. And then Hadori kind of sold it to me by saying like, oh yeah, we want you, gotta you to do be it like Devitt. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh man, you got to be like Devitt. You know? <laughs> he's good. He's English too. Oh no, he's Irish. Oh, just say, man. Just, just sign, say. bro. Just, but like, yeah, uh, I think the thing was, it's definitely because like my dad was starting to get better as well. So I was like, okay. And I didn't know New Japan wanted to sign me. I just knew they wanted me for two shows. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Japan. Uh, I think I made a decision. I told Regal, I told all those guys, uh, I don't think it's right for me yet. I don't want to move away from home. I'm going to go do New Japan. And they kind of went, okay, cool. And just yeah. hung up the phone. <laughs> uh, they weren't very, I don't think they were very happy about it. I've still got the voicemail on my phone. It's quite funny. Yeah, uh, sure. I've got a couple e- emails that I have of rejection. That <laughs> they're still like saved in my inbox, yeah. but I'm like, I don't want to do it. I got the voicemail yet. just because I was like, I think it's a real, like, just mm. call cool, just every now and again, like, call cool, WWE, call me. That's <laughs> cool, isn't it? But, uh, uh, yeah, just like going going there and I didn't know I was signing. Like, I didn't know anything. They brought me to their office and I was like, okay, here's a deal. We want to sign you full time. And I didn't know what that meant. Like, I don't, I've never dealt with, I've never seen a contract before in my entire life. Like, so it was there and I'd like had to read it myself. And like, I'm dyslexic yeah. as well. So, like, every single word was being jumbled up. But I was kind of like, it takes a lot for me to trust somebody as well. And, but I just, I trust these guys. I don't think they would ever do me wrong. So I was just, I read it. As you, best as I could. No and, sign on that day. And you know the Japanese culture. Like they're. Uh, no, I too, don't. Do you not know? No, I mean, I, they're too. Sw- I'm saying now. Now I do, but they're the sweet. It's, they're, they're just kind. I don't think there's any dickheads here. Well, maybe. I, I had one, dick, one dickhead in my entire life here. Yeah. Like, but yeah, I I love this place. I, I don't think I could be anywhere else. Because like, I think that's the thing. Like when you. When I first came here. Like I in my head, I was like, I'm, I'm, I think this is the platform I need to get to WWE because in my head, I'm like, WWE is the place to go. WWE is all I need to be, like to be a star and to have that fulfillment. I need to be in WWE. And then I had my first match here, and I went, I never want to go there. Mm-hmm. And I, subconsciously, I think it was when I watched Marafuji and Okada, and Marafuji was like a huge deal for me, like seeing him live. I was like, God, that's Marafuji. And you can look at Okada now, and you can. You know, I do, and I'm yeah. like, "Fuck, that's a star, yeah, right?" That's the biggest guy, probably in the like the biggest star in 
maybe no, not the not the world of wrestling. I mean, maybe he looks like, a, like I know, like you look at WWE and you're like, oh my god, Triple H, The Rock, or whatever. That's a star, but like the, the way same he way himself. Like, what's that? The way he yeah, he or himself. presented or promoted. Yeah. You know, yeah. don't don't forget that we're all people, we're all just people, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing as like you look at Okada and you look at, at the way that he's presented and promoted and, and I'm just like god damn that there's guy's money like, falling from yeah, the ceiling right? and it's like this is what I want yeah. I want money falling and you're from working the your way there too right like I'm, I'm doing my best yeah yeah so yeah I'm yeah. just happy to be here so uh, it's pretty cool oh meme life was cool you, is, meme all the, stemming from Ricochet so you became a thing yeah that <laughs> whatever Um, I don't know you were a little like it became what's the word polarized a little bit there i think was, everyone just called me the white ricochet like a little bit yeah but a lot of like all of a sudden there was a lot of people for you and or against you like hard right you know what i'm saying yeah yeah like a lot of people were like uh this is wrestling or this isn't right wrestling, you right? kind of stemmed a, almost i don't want to say a movement like an argument in wrestling yeah, or like a, like a conversation yeah. that should be coming up right yeah. and to be fair like a lot of really good points were made when that match happened in super juniors a lot of points i did look at and go oh no to be fair they're right and but then i was like no no no, why is this wrong and why is this right and i kind of like to hear everyone's side of it but like me and trev did that match and we just didn't think everything off it was (laughs) it's just one of our matches that we do yeah but like because it was on such a bigger scale and i think because new japan promoted it so much it's just like yeah you're gonna want to watch this match main event of kurikin and it was one of the weirdest things ever. Like, this is awesome chance, holy shit chance, one more match chance in Kurikin to the point where I was like, I almost didn't like it. I was like, this is not the chance you normally hear. Here. Right. You're used to but, the subtle ch- clapping of the yeah, Japanese. But it was like the idea, though, that like what we did wasn't pro wrestling. And I kind of was like, oh, I, I would beg to differ. I'd like to point out that everything we did, at least we went for something or like, went for like a trademark of what we do and what like this is what ricochet and will osprey would do in my opinion it's mm-hmm. like we're a damn marvel movie <laughs> and you've like how do you see uh i don't know if this is better like like how do you see your wrestling now like do you- i think it's a lot different like i think i have gone through a lot what back then no no like i just I, and as is closing this up i guess it's just like i'd love to look like your envision of wrestling like um yeah, I, don't know. I I mean, I'm always open to interpretation of what like wrestling is, but I just I think the main thing is is after getting a ring with guys like Shibata and Tanahashi and Hiromu and so many like I this year's has been hectic for me. Like I've had to go through like learning a junior heavyweight style to then being thrown in the deep end with the heavyweights and just like having sink or swim because like all the all the guys left and the right thing that New Japan has always done when guys have left there's always guys ready to step up and mm. they book that so well that uh i generally have like a wider concept like i can do a lucha Libre match if you want me to i can do like a british chain wrestling match but my style is kind of like i like to do a little bit of a hybrid style i like to try and show people now that i have uh put a little bit more mass on my body as well so i'm trying to strength show like i can't do many of the twists i used to do <laughs> as well like so and then i'll say this we think of how I, I want to know if you if the, you think about this because I do all the time. Of we look at like I don't know even red right like you look at like oh, wrestling from like the eighties to the nineties and how fast it went and then like mm. nine and then you like nineties early two thousand like red and like red was like blowing people's mind and then like now like you know you guys are doing the crazy shit you're doing mm. like how fast it's going and how fast the movements and the spots are right like yeah like we think like okay it can't get topped in that so in twenty years. Have you thought about tw- in 20 years, like what wrestling's going to be? I, uh, 25 years? Until like, so the one thing I'm waiting to see, and I don't know if, I don't think it's possible, but I want to see someone do like a double rotation shooting star press off the top yeah, rope. Yeah, that's the next But the I think that thing. is the next step. I think like, do you think I could do it? No, I don't think I can. Like I barely can make like shooting but star But someone presses, will figure it out. But huh? someone will. And the because no one t- happen- a, a 450 Scorpio doing a 450 was the craziest thing ever in the 80s yeah and like right do you remember when Liger Liger which by the way is still mental that Liger is the person that invented yeah. the shooting star press and now he's just like one of your co-workers yeah, yeah. like <laughs> which is mental Dude, Tenzan told me today he likes my character and I was, my heart <laughs> melted 
I was like, fuck. But that's cool. Fucking like, hell, it's cool. Like Nagata and like yes. guys like Tano would like carry this company to newer heights and like should have the biggest ego of all time, but it's the most humble yes. dude yeah. ever. Yeah. Guys like Okada are like, people look at him and go, that is the coolest motherfucker of all time. We see a different Okada yeah. backstage. <laughs> we see this goofball right. and just like. But I'm saying the 450 and then someone started doing a six third you know what i'm yeah, saying like someone put another twist on right it. crazy it's yeah. just fucking crazy and the idea someone that, did a moonsault amazing red did a 540 moonsault right. like, and so there's gonna be next steps there's gonna be steps but like I, and I faster action right i think there's gonna be robots as well <laughs> like I, I, ddt will serious. come up with oh that. yeah it's like a <laughs> wrestling robot like yeah i definitely think so and it's gonna be so much better than promos at us and <laughs> we're all gonna suck and then we're all gonna get out of work and then there's gonna be this is this like race war between robots and humans in wrestling. They're taking our jobs. Yep. That's- taking the jobs. <laughs> South Park fan, I like it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, bud. Yeah. That's it. Is that it? Are we missing anything? Uh no. Great. No, that's all good. But yeah. thank you very much for having me. It's Thanks, generally dude. I generally love having a little chat with you. It was a nice little chat. It was a lovely chat. Mm. And there you have it, at Will Ospreay on Twitter and Instagram, or you can buy his merch, willospreay.bigcartel.com. I saw some posters that were up for sale from the Tokyo Dome, or, of course, my preferred link, prowrestlingtees.com slash Will Ospreay. And that was before the Tokyo Dome. Him and Hiromu tore it up at the Tokyo Dome. Uh, I'm sure he's going to continue to tear it up more and more. Will Ospreay on the show. Uh, that is the show for this week. Before we get out of here, I do have some plugs and upcoming events. All right, the best way that you can support patreon.com slash Colt Cabana. That is where you can listen to all of these shows ad free. I always put up new fun stuff. I have so much weird stuff that I'll just put on the Patreon, but mainly it's the home of the archives of the art of wrestling. Also, ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Colt Cabana, Facebook slash Colt Cabana, ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. Maybe you're a promoter, want to put me on your upcoming show or convention. I got a YouTube channel, I also have a website, ColtCabana.com. That's where you can find my P.O. Box, and uh, if you send me some stuff in the P.O. Box, I'll probably talk about it on these uh, next five shows coming up. Upcoming, January 24th, 26th, 27th, 30th, and February 1st, Tampa, Nashville, Raleigh, Miami, and Atlanta, and JPW1972.com. Friday, February 7th, Denver, Colorado, Facebook slash Primo's Wrestling. Saturday, February 8th, Rahway, New Jersey, ProWrestlingOnline.com, WrestleProOnline.com. Thursday, February 27th, Winnipeg, Canada, WrestleMax 2. And let's talk WrestleMania weekend in Tampa. Friday and Saturday in the morning and afternoon, I'll be at WrestleCon.com. I'll also be doing their variety show Thursday night, Joey Ryan's penis party Saturday night, and their breakfast and softball game on Sunday. I'm doing a live Art of Wrestling at The Collective Friday at 4. And I'll also be doing Brian Zane's movie watch along Saturday at 3. Intro music was by the ukulele teacher on YouTube. Outro music by Super Fun Yeah Yeah Rocket Ship. Podcast cover art designed by Jimmy Lee. Photo by James Musselwhite. Thanks to our sponsors, HighSpots.com and the High Spots Network. The VOD service with brand new $5 wrestling starring myself and Marty DeRosa. Of course, all those PWGs, best friends, Eagles Amigos. You can also get AMA knee pads, gear, a wrestling mask, even a wrestling ring. And OneHourTees.com. They help run ProWrestlingTees.com. I got a store, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Colt Cabana. All right, that is episode number one in the books. I hope you dig it. Please tell people. If uh, people listen, there will be a, a second batch coming out after this batch. But this is just the start. All I ask is you keep subscribed. You tell people to stay subscribed. And I know I said I'd be doing two a month. So I will guess I'll let you in on a little secret. Shouldn't be a secret. We'll have another episode next week. So I'll see you next week. Until then, this has been the Art of Wrestling for Colt Cabana. I'm Colt Cabana. Thanks. I read the Meltzer stuff, not them. That's funny. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) I I thought of it with my brain. Uh, You can keep it on there, yeah.